Hello everyone and welcome, it's Mike Pants Chess here and today we've got another game, this time it's played between Ratmir Kolmov and Rashid Nezmetinov. Played in the year 1947 in the All Union Candidate Master Tournament. So many of you may not be familiar with Kolmov but he was a Russian chess grandmaster and won many international tournaments in Eastern Europe during his career and tied for the Soviet Championships in 1963. So he's not very well known in the West because he never competed there during his career peak. He was often confined to events in socialist countries. And he was actually considered one of the strongest Soviet players in the mid-1950s and the 1970s. So he's played in the Soviet Championships in 1963, actually he's tied with Boris Spassky. And actually had his finest international tournament in a Capablanca Memorial. And he was considered a formidable attacking player, but he recorded victories against Petrosian, Spassky... Fisher and Kasparov during his career. So obviously this guy is absolutely no mug. So this makes this game all the more interesting. So we've got two very strong players playing against one another in 1947. So in this game Kolmov was white and Nezmetnov was playing black. So we're going to look at it from the black perspective. So we'll get straight into it. D4 was played by white, knight to f6, knight to f3, Nezmetnov played d6. And h3 was played by white. Quite a weird move, but uh, you'll see his plan soon. After g6, he played bishop f4. So this is kind of like a London system in a way. Basically, h3 just gives this bishop some space on h2 if it's ever attacked with, let's say, knight h5 at some point. But there's meant to have continued with bishop g7. White played c4. Black castled. White played knight c3. And then there's meant to have developed his knight to c6. And he said in his book, Nesmetnov wasn't actually too put off by this bishop f4 move in the opening. He didn't think white had a strong attack. And he believed that he was going to play e5 at some point, and this would um, really help black's position. For instance here, if uh, white played d5, attacking the knight, black could opt in for e5 right here, in fact. Because d takes c6, black can just take the bishop. And if takes takes, black's got an absolutely fabulous position already. They've castled, got the two bishops out, the knight's going to jump into e4, and Stockfish actually gives this as plus 3 for black. So an amazing position if um, white went in for this. But in fact, if white did play d5, after e5, they should actually just go bishop g5, and black can go knight to e7. But still, black's got a fine position. So back in the game, white didn't push to d5, they just played e3, supporting their d4 pawn, and developing their bishop on f1. There's Metnov develops his knight backwards to d7, unleashing the bishop on g7. But the main idea is to play e5 and hit out at this bishop and so cause some problems in the centre and just dominate some more squares. Now, Nesmetnov thought bishop e2 was good for white here because after e5, white can just capture. And if black captures, just play bishop h2. And this is considered an equal game. I think black will play moves like f5, though, in the future. So it has some sort of um, control over the position in the centre. Queen c2 was also another move that maybe white could have played here. Um, black would have gone e5 as well. Takes, takes, bishop g5. Nesmetnov said he would have played f6. If bishop h4, he would have gone g5. And if bishop g3, actually, he would have played f5. Preparing the move f4. And actually, black's got a better game already in this position. Um, it's humiliating for white to have to prepare for a move like f4 here. The bishop's just going to be totally bad on h2. But rather than be passive, Kolmov actually went for the initiative a bit. He played d5, attacking the knight on c6. Nesmetnov moved the knight to e5, and white played bishop to e2. And black just captured the knight on f3, the bishop recaptured. And finally, Nesmetnov gets his e5 move in, attacking the bishop on f4. If bishop g3 here, if he drops it back, Nesmetnov was going to play f5. And this is a great position for black to be in. They could play f4 at some point, or e4, and probably play moves like b6, a5, and knight to c5. a5 just stops b4 ideas, but once knight c5 is in, uh, the, the ideas just flow. f4 will probably be a massive target for black to get in. So for this reason, after this e5 move, obviously white just recaptured. d takes e6 on pass on. Black recaptured, and white castled. So black's position is pretty decent here, but I like Nesmetnov's next move. I think a lot of players would just go e5 here, but this really weakens the white squares. This would allow white to infiltrate on d5 with the bishop or even the knight. Uh, but instead, Nesmetnov just goes knight to e5. 
I think the point is that uh, the black knight is threatening to take the bishop on f3. And if the queen recaptured, he could play e5 because the rook is um, pinning everything on the f-file. For instance, let's say a3 here, just knight takes. If queen takes, there's moves like e5. I suppose maybe actually queen d5 can be played. But even so, let's say king h8. The bishop has to move somewhere. It has to go backwards to g3. And I think black's got an absolutely fine game here. I think they can play c6 or even just bishop f5. It's no problems for black. But uh, white didn't want the bishop taking off, so they played bishop to e2, dropping their bishop backwards. And there's Metnoff now played b6. He said in his book he, he thought he should have played knight to f7, preparing e5 again. If queen c2, he would have played e5, dropping the bishop back, and then he could play bishop e6. And there's Metnoff just said he preferred this variation, he thought it was better for black. However, in the game, he just played b6. I think this is a fine move as well. Just feeding chess as bishop to b7, controlling some white squares. Actually, he says in his book he was worried about b6 because he thought maybe white should have taken the knight on e5. If bishop takes, he could have played bishop f3 from white, attacking the rook. If the rook moves, he thought this may have been good for white. But still, it seems quite even. Black's got the two bishops. Maybe they could play even bishop b7 and trade a, the white square bishop off. I don't think black's got any problems. But anyway, back to the game. So bishop g3 is played by white, dropping their bishop backwards. And there's Metnoff played bishop a6, attacking the c4 pawn. And here actually white has uh, a good attack. They sack two pawns now. Kolmov played f4, hits the knight on e5. And this is a very interesting variation. So he allows knight takes c4, where black just won a free pawn. Threatening now to play knight takes e3 as well. So white's got to do something here, and they play queen to a4. Attacking the knight and the bishop at the same time because the bishop hits this knight. Now I think, just thinking about this, I think if knight takes e3 here, I think just queen takes a6 is good for white because even if knight takes the rook, they can just play rook takes knight. And what's the assessment here? White's got two pieces for the rook, but he's actually two pawns down. So it's hard to judge. It's a very unbalanced position. But in all honesty, maybe I prefer to play white in this variation just because it might be easy to pick some of um, black's pawns apart the white squares are incredibly weak for black here so i don't recommend black going in for this variation in the game black actually played knight takes b2 so wins another pawn attacks the queen on a4 allows queen takes a6 but then black has bishop takes the knight on c3 so after the smoke has cleared somewhat black's emerged two pawns up but now has some defending to do. They've got to defend this knight on b2, which is very awkward. Queen a3 was played by white, attacking the bishop. The bishop drops back, but still protecting the knight on b2. But now rook a to b1. And the point is that white is now threatening to take this knight and get two pieces for the rook, which would be very advantageous. Nesmetov played queen to f6 to defend the knight further. And Kolmov played rook to c1. Preparing ideas like rook c2 or rook takes c7. For instance, if black defends this c7 pawn with rook fc8, white has a very nice position. They can play bishop to e1, preparing bishop c3, uh, which would be winning the knight on b7. So if queen f7, white can still play bishop c3, and if takes, takes. There's no way to save this knight. I mean, black's still got two pawns, but you prefer to have a piece over um, the two pawns. Piece is a piece at the end of the day. But after this move, um, Nesmetov actually gives his next move with an exclamation. He played d5. Uh, I think it's a good move actually because what this does is just give the knight a space to jump into c4 with. So if um, rook c2 here trying to win the knight, then black can just play knight c4. And once there's a trade, black has c5. And we've got equal material, but again, I think black's got a better position now. Maybe play queen f5 and e5. And this pawn chain by black is just lovely. So yeah, you probably prefer to take black here, I would imagine. After d5 then, white set about winning some material black. They played rook takes the pawn, rook takes c7. And there's better played rook to f7. So trying to trade off a pair of rooks, perhaps. And actually white didn't want to trade, they dropped the rook back to c2 and now attacking this knight which is forced to jump back to c4. Kolmov took it, the pawn recaptured and then rook takes. So the smoke has definitely cleared now and we'll see what's ha happened. So the material is dead equal, both sides have a pair of bishops and they have 
five pawns each. However, black has the majority on the queen side, so maybe this will play dividends in the end in the end game. So if all material is swapped off, it could be easier for black to win this. So that's vital information I'm sure both players were aware of during the game. But now I really like Nesmedov's next move. Just rook d8, so gains the open file. And the plan is just to grab the second rank. In rook middle games and end games, it's very important that you try and get on these seventh and second ranks. In most of the games, the aggressor is usually the winner. And it's very good to be aggressive in this sort of situation. So white plays rook b c1. And Nesmedov just plays bishop f8. Attacks the queen, the queen jumps into b3, and actually bishop c5 is played by Nesmetnov. A brilliant idea because it blocks the c-file now, and also hits at this weak e3 pawn. So Nesmetnov's really helped out his position here by putting the bishop on c5. And perhaps white should do the same. Maybe they should play bishop e1 here, and stop black from playing rook to d2. If play continues, rook d7, white still has king h2. If queen f5, white can play bishop h4 and just activate their bishop and the minor piece. They need to do this. If rook d3, then rook to c3, they can trade, queen takes, and this is actually just a dead even position. And we'll probably most likely end up in a draw. And this is what Nesmetov thought white should have done. They should have played bishop e1 just to activate their minor piece. Um, but they're a bit sloppy and maybe too defensive here. They play king h2. And Nesmetov just punishes this by playing rook to d2. And I think these are just slight inaccuracies, but they're all adding up to the fact that now black probably has the advantage in this position. Saying that though, I actually found an incredible draw using uh, Stockfish. White should now play rook to c2. If rook d7 then takes twice, and white can just play bishop to e1. And if rook to e2 to attack this pawn on e3, white has a, a brilliant sacrifice, an exchange sacrifice actually. Rook takes c5. If the pawn recaptures, bishop c3, we attack the queen. The queen jumps into e7, but now white can play queen c4. And where should black go with the rook here? Well, there's not many squares for it to go to. It could go rook c2 maybe, or rook to f2, but it's going to get attacked by the queen or the king. So if rook f2, the king will attack it, and if rook c2, I imagine the queen will attack it. So the obvious choice is rook takes e3. And now, actually, the rook is trapped, in a manner of speaking. Bishop d2 attacks the rook. And where should the rook go? It's got no spaces. Literally, the only space it's got is rook to a3. So the rook goes there. But now white can play bishop c1. Attacks the rook again. And it's got no squares to go to on the third rank. And it's got one square to go to on the A file, which is rook A5. And again, white just plays bishop D2. The rook goes back to A3 because it's the only square, and bishop C1. And we're getting to a perpetual check. So this is an absolutely incredible draw. I don't think white would have ever found this, but it was very interesting to find. But going back to the game, instead of rook to C2 then, White actually did make a mistake. Rook e4 is a terrible inaccuracy. The rook just looks really awkwardly placed here. And there's Menov takes full advantage with queen to b2. The point is it's got a battery now on the second rank, attacking this g2 pawn. Queen takes queen is mandatory. Rook takes is played, and now they're attacking this a2 pawn. If white played rook d1 to gain the open file, I think there's Menov would have taken. Rook eight takes a2, and if rook takes e6, they can play a5. And if e4, then this is a horrible mistake because then black can just launch these pawns up with a4, e5, a3, rook e8, and then just rook f8. And black's in a one position here. They're going to queen this a pawn. But if rook d1, then rook takes a2. Again, rook takes e6 and a5. But here, white should just go in for this long drawn variation. We have rook to d8, rook f8, rook to d7, and then just a4. White now has a move f5, because if rook takes f5, then white can play bishop e5. If rook f7, rook e8, bishop f8, and rook d to d8. So black's just about defending everything, but they have to secure the bishop on f8. And after bishop c3, a3, e4. A few more moves, rook c7, attacking the bishop. The bishop goes there to d4. 
Knight gets behind the pawn, rook takes d4, rook takes f8, and this is a drawn game now. Rook f2, b5, and then just rook takes a2, and we're into a drawn end game. That was a very long variation, so I'm sorry about that. But I just wanted to show you what would happen if maybe white played a different move here with rook d1. However, saying that, Kolmov played a different move. He played a4. So, protecting the pawn by just moving it away. But this allows black to grab the open file, rook d7. But white takes the pawn on e6. However, Nesmitnov gains another battery, rook d to d2. And now they're just attacking this g2 pawn. Rook g1 doesn't work because then black just plays rook e2 and takes this e3 pawn off instead. So Kolmov had to play h4 here, giving the king some space on h3. Nesmetnov captured on g2 with check. The king moved and they just played rook e2, so attacking this e3 pawn. If white decided to protect it by pushing it up, I think this is a mistake because then black just plays rook to b3. If h5, rook e to e3, attacking the bishop. If they try to defend, then just rook f3, attacking the rook on g1. And if rook g2, they have an amazing move, bishop to f2, and they're going to win this bishop on g3. So white's got to be careful. In the game, Kolmov played rook to d1. I think this is a good move, grabbing some space in the open file on the d-file, and just going to try and hassle Nesmetlinov. King f7 was played, though by black, attacking the rook. The rook went backwards to e4, and Nesmetlinov played h5. A very nice move. So what this does is stops the white king from escaping to g4, and black's now got some mating ideas. They could play rook to b1, and play rook to h1, delivering some sort of checkmate in the long run. For instance, let's say white played rook d7 here. Black could play king f6, and if rook takes a7, they've got rook b1. And there's no way for white to stop this checkmate, because the rook covers the second rank, and this pawn's now covering the escape square. Saying that, though, after h5, there is actually another draw that white could have gone in for here. They could have played uh, the very precarious move, f5. The point is, if black takes this, then white can play rook e5, attacking f5. Um, and there's no way for black to successfully defend this pawn. If king g6, then just rook e6 check, king f7, rook e5, just go backwards and forwards, it'll be a perpetual. And if king f6 instead, then just rook f1. And there's no way to defend this f5 pawn. Black can play rook takes e3, but then just rook f takes f5, king g6, and check. And there's no way to stop the checks, king f7, just rook g5. Um, and that'll be a draw as well. So if White wanted it, maybe he could have gone in for the draw. I'm not sure what he was thinking here. Maybe he didn't want to draw and he thought he could win the game. But uh, that was an idea anyway. So after h5, Kolmov played rook e5, and there's Metnov just played king to f6. They could have taken this pawn if they wanted. A lot of captures would occur, and then rook d7 would have finished it with king f6. White could have captured the pawn after rook a2 f5, king takes, rook f7, a few more moves, but I think actually at the end, black just has the advantage, you're going to run this b5 pawn down the board. After rook e5, which is technically a mistake, black could have taken the e3 pawn, Nesmetnov just played king f6 though. Kolmov played f5, and Nesmetnov did finally take this e3 pawn off with rook takes. But again, this technically was a mistake, Stockfish has given another drawn endgame. White could have taken this pawn on g6, if king takes, play rook g5, and if king f6, take the pawn on h5. If rook a2, there's rook d7, bishop e7 to stop any checkmate ideas, and white can just take the pawn on a7, rook a to a3, but there's rook g5 to defend the bishop. If bishop d6, white can just defend again, rook takes g3, rook takes g3, bishop takes, rook takes, rook takes a4. Again, this is a drawn endgame. Both sides have a pawn each, and they're going to run their pawns down the board. But in the game, rook d6 check was played instead by whites. The point is, after this Metnov takes this, there's rook takes e3. But now, bishop takes g3 was played, rook takes g3, and there's Metnov just took on f5. And now, actually, black's just two pawns up. A uh, very easy endgame to win. Rook g5 was played by Kolmov. Nesmetnov checked on b3 and the king went to g2. And actually in his book, Nesmetnov actually just says this is a matter of technique now. 
So rook b4 attacking two pawns. Komov takes on h5. Nesmetov takes on a4. The king goes to f3 and Nesmetov gets his king in the centre. Rook h8 trying to get behind the king and the pawns. But uh, rook a3 and after king g2 he can hide behind this f pawn. h5 trying to get a queen but it's probably not going to work. Rook g3. After a few more moves. So Komov still pushes his pawn down the board. But eventually there's nowhere to push it to because the rook's just guarding the 7th rank. Nesmetov puts his rook on h7. And now rook g6 to defend the pawn. And Nesmetov just runs his b pawn down. b5. King h3 and then b4, king h4 and b3. After king h5, there's b2 and rook g1 is just about in time to stop black from um, getting a queen. But he gets his rook behind the pawn. There's nothing really white can do. They can't push his pawn because it'll get taken. So Kormov plays rook b1, has to blockade it. And there's just now a5. King g6 by white, a4 h7 and here black can successfully take this h7 pawn because if the king takes here then a3 will be played and if you know your chess you'll know that if two pawns ever reach the third or sixth rank trying to queen themselves then the rook is actually unable to stop them and here this is the case for instance if the king goes to g7 we just have a2 rook takes and then black gets a queen so after rook takes h7 white takes on b2 instead Rook a7 was played by Nesmetnov. Rook b4 check. King e3, king takes f5 and just a3. And that's all she wrote because um, it's just game over. White resigned the game here. Uh, there's no way to stop this a pawn from running. White will have to play a move like rook to b1 and after a2, blockade it again. But the king's just too close. It'll get into b2 and black or queen and probably finish up doing a rook and king checkmate. But anyway, this was a different side to Nesmetnov this time. There was a lot of trades and it went to whittled down to an end game. So it was a very nice game of a very strong player. Again, Kolmov has defeated Kasparov and Fischer at certain points in time, so he's no mug. So again, we got a very nice game from Nesmetnov, and he probably does deserve a Grandmaster title. I think he was just unfortunate in his life not to get one. But anyway, again, thank you for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please drop a like, comment or subscribe. It really helps out with this channel. I'm hoping to make some more chess videos very soon and hope to see you in the next ones. Thanks very much.